All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, it is uh, wonderful to be here uh, and an honor to have you join us today for our annual uh, Nirvan lecture here at Florida International University. Um, our Jane Studies program is one of the oldest uh, in the United States, and we're happy to host, um, I believe it's our 13th annual uh, Nirvan lecture. Uh, today, we are going to be focusing on a very important topic uh, in terms of thinking about how um, the future of these Jane endowments um, are able to both uh, ensure uh, scholarly rigor within the study of Jainism, but also to be able to connect to um, the interests of the Jain community that's endowed it. And I think one of the places where this intersection uh, happens, and I think that could be a really wonderful and important stream of, um, of study and thinking, um, is thinking about the, the Jane youth in the United States, um, thinking about kind of the 1.5, the uh, second generation, and what this form of Jainism would look like, um, you know, thinking 20 years ahead, um, 30 years ahead from now. So I think it's an important um, topic of study. And over the course of the last uh, two, uh, I don't know, maybe the, the last, uh, well, at least um, for us for the last uh, two, a couple of years, um, especially Professor Shah has been working on it. Professor Mehta has also been working on it. Um, Professor Miller and I have more recently come into thinking about sort of Jane youth. Um, and we all come from different um, academic and sort of um, academic and sort of perspectives. Um, some from within the Jain tradition, some from without the Jain tradition. And so, what we wanted to do today is to bring um, scholars from around the world. Um, currently, I'm uh, joining you from the University University of Management and Technology in Lahore, in Pakistan. Professor Shah is joining you, uh, joining us from the UK. Professors Mehta and Miller are joining us from California. So it's a truly, truly kind of global conversation thinking about uh, the connections and the future of the Jane community. And there's a lot of topics that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about uh, thinking about assimilation, talk, talking about what it means to be an American, thinking about what Jane religion looks like in the 21st century in the age of globalization. Um, and so we're very honored to have all of these uh, remarkable scholars here with us today uh, to join. What I would like uh, to do now is to begin with um, Professor uh, Bindi Shah, who is joining us um, from uh, Southampton uh, University in the UK. So she is a lecturer in sociology um, and she uh, within the Department of Sociology, Social Policy and Criminology. Um, and her work uh, focuses on migration, religion, nationhood, citizenship, and belonging. Um, and she specifically published on the second generation Jane diaspora um, in the US and the UK. She um, thinks about uh, the topics from various different sort of perspectives, in, including uh, feminist and post-colonial perspectives. Um, uh, and she has won a tremendous number of uh, book uh, awards, um, including the uh, book awards for social sciences, Asian American uh, 2012s, honorable mention in American Sociological Association for Asian and Asia uh, in an Asian American section. Um, she's a successfully uh, supervised uh, numerous doctoral students. So she's a, a leading scholar uh, of Jainism and we I'll cede the floor to her. Um, for her talk uh, on uh, the future of American Jane youth. Professor Shah, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Professor uh, Iqbal Akhtar, you know, for that generous introduction and for inviting me to contribute to this panel on Jane youth and the future of the American diaspora. I'm very much looking forward to the conversations with Professor Mehta, with Professor Miller, uh, with Professor Akhtar, and also all of you in the virtual audience as well. So very much looking forward to the discussions. 
What I thought I would do is begin by introducing my broad research interests because um, I'm a sociologist, I'm not a Jane Scott study scholar per se, and I come to the study of Jane youth from an interest in how the children of Asian immigrants in the US and the UK are constructing their identities and a sense of community and belonging in the diaspora. About 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to conduct an in-depth ethnographic research on Jane, young Janes between the ages of 18 to 30. And in sociological terms, I call them second generation Janes because they're either born in the US or UK or came to these countries uh, with their parents at a very young age. And in this research, I've been interested in several questions. How are young Janes uh, interpreting and practicing Jain Dharma? What meaning does this practice have for them in their lives? How are young Jains translating or transforming a Jain Dharma in new settings? And what kind of communities and community organizations they are building? So the study involved in-depth interviews with 30 young Jains in each country, 60 in total, and they all identified as having some sort of committed practice to Jain Dharma. But I here I want to point out from the outset that my participants do not constitute a representative sample of all Jain youth in the UK and the US, and so I'm not claiming any, any gen generalizations here. My research also included uh, participation in several YJA and Jaina conventions in the US and one Jain convention and several events organized by YJ UK in, the, in Britain. I also analyzed magazines, newsletters, websites of Young Jains UK and YJA and other materials that have been produced and consumed by Young Jains. And I've interviewed people whom I identify as lay leaders in the Jain community who interact with Jain youth in each country. Then this past summer, I decided it was time to conduct another round of interviews to see if any shifts had occurred over the past 10 years. And uh, I just wanted to let the audience know out there that I'm still looking for participants. So if you are between the ages of 18 to 30, identify as committed to some sort of Jane practice and were either born in the US or, or came at a very young age, please get in touch because I'm looking for uh, some more interview participants. Okay, with that little intro, what I wanted to do with the rest of my time is to give you some highlights of the main themes that have emerged in my research and how that might help us think about the topic for the lecture today, Jane Youth and the Future of the American Diaspora. The first theme relates to overt religious activities such as regular rituals. What is overwhelmingly clear in my study is that the majority of second generation youth, Jain youth who self-identified as committed to some form of Jain practice were not interested in overt daily activities. Only a small minority carried out regular overt religious rituals or duties. So for example, in the US, uh, two women and one man perform Samayak on a regular basis, though not daily. And one woman in the US, US had observed eight days of silence during Parushan. Similarly, in the, in the UK, two women and two men in my sample performed Samayak on a regular basis, though not daily. And two women and two men had observed eight days of silence during one of the Parushans that they had participated in. In the UK, none of my participants visited Jain temple regularly. In contrast though, participants in the US did visit Jain temples on a regular basis. And when they went there, they performed prayers or joined rituals such as Aarti. Though I would argue that the reason for this difference is that in the US, Jain centers are also, also function as community centers and so draw young Jains for more than just religious reasons. The one overt religious activity that has come to have much significance for many of my participants in both countries is Parushan or Daslakshan. Almost all of the Jain youth in my study participated in this religious festival in some way, whether it was through observing further dietary restrictions during the eight or 10 days, undertaking fasts, 
performing Pratikama on the last day, if not on any other days, uh, and going to the temple or community halls to listen to uh, the religious lectures. Okay, so if rituals are not important, what is important to Jain youth committed to a Jain practice in the 21st century? The second theme relates to living the Dharma. For all my participants, it was far more important to, and here I quote one young man, to practice, practice it through my daily living. The participants in my study lived the Dharma in various ways. So one young woman said that for her generation, it was important to remain, and I quote here, strong enough that you live by your values in all aspects of life. Several respondents specifically mentioned that they were disappointed with their parents' and grandparents' generations because these elders placed great emphasis on rituals and visiting the temple, but then were not able to apply Jain principles in other arenas of their lives. So for example, one young woman pointed out that elders, quote, get really angry and upset over certain things in their daily lives rather than trying to maintain equanimity. Secondly, for all my participants, living by the values and practicing the ethic of ahimsa meant being vegetarian or vegan. For one of my participants, whom I will quote Parita, being vegetarian was, and I quote, one of the biggest elements of being Jain because the core of our belief system is being compassionate towards all living beings, end quote. Now, Anne Valeli has argued that in India, the Jain dietary discourse is a singular discourse that is associated with avoiding violence to two to five sense beings and embodies the value of worldly transcendence. However, in my research, I found that in the US, this discourse is being broadened to encompass world affirming values of compassion and ahimsa which while not absent in the traditional discourse is now linked to social change, animal rights, and more broadly to the environment, to environmental sustainability in both countries. So since the late 1990s, many young Jains in the West have been influenced by the animal rights movement and have chosen to adopt vegan diets as one way to practice the ethic of ahimsa, a trend that I also found among some of my participants. Akash, who had been vegan for several years when I interviewed him, said it was important to have a general awareness of animal rights issues as well as environmental issues because both are linked to the Jain maxim of preventing or minimizing suffering for all five to one sense beings. A third way that some of my participants showed commitment to practicing Jain Dharma was to spend time to understand what they call true religion. They engaged in continuous reading and reflection of Jain religious texts, prayers, and stories, either through self-study, participation in peer-led study groups, or by attending Jain study classes at local Jain centers. And finally, a fourth way that my participants showed a commitment to Jain Dharma was by engaging in seva activities that ensured the reproduction of the Jain community and Jain practice in the diaspora. So some of my participants were active as national or regional representatives of YJA or in their local Jain center, or indeed in the Srimad Raj Chandra youth groups, which emerged in the UK around 2010 and in the US, US a few years later. Through these institutional structures, they were involved in teaching Jain Dharma, organizing events that would be attractive to Jain youth, and producing newsletters, magazines, and podcasts for a youth audience. I now want to spend a few minutes to talk about why it was important for Jain youth in my study to live the Dharma and spend time understanding the true Dharma. Firstly, practicing Jain Dharma in these ways provides a moral compass for young Jains in the diaspora. Many of my participants said, Practicing Jain Dharma helped them to be what they call a good person. Jain youth are living in and growing up in pluralist and multicultural, multi faith societies like the US and the UK. 
So Jain philosophy and principles and the related codes of conduct help young Jains to navigate and deal with multiple and often conflicting value systems. For instance, my participants in the US in particular mentioned the prevalence of violence at multiple levels in US society. The principle of ahimsa and the related codes of conduct help my respondents to distinguish between right and wrong responses to instances of violence that they encountered in their daily lives. Secondly, it is important to live the Dharma because Jain youth live in a time and place where there is a complexity of living in which change is rapid and intense. The number of choices one has to make about any aspect of life has proliferated and there is a great deal of risk and uncertainty. For young people, these risks and uncertainties are often related to jobs and careers, or increasingly to unexpected death and chronic illness amongst those close to them. And over the past 18 months, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought additional risks and, and uncertainties. So for some of my participants, understanding Jain philosophy and values help them to deal with such uncertainties and risks in modern life and to control their negative emotions during difficult times. Just to give you one example here, one young woman whom I interviewed said that her understanding of karma theory had helped her deal with the difficulties she was experiencing in finding a job in the financial sector for which she had been trained. In describing how she dealt with the emotional ups and downs, she said, and I quote, I took away with uh, the attachment to what I really, really want, opened it up a little bit more, and then actually got a really good job, end quote. Now, if this job was not in the financial sector, it was actually at a yoga center, but she came to realize that this job had actually revealed her true calling. And over the past 18 months, many of those whom I've interviewed this year managed to maintain a sense of calm by using time during lockdowns to create a regular, often daily routine of listening to Jane lectures, organizing virtual server activities for the local community or raising funds to send to India. And the final point that I want to make is that a focus on living the Dharma and spending time to understand true Dharma enables both young Jain women and young Jain men to follow a committed Jain practice in the diaspora. Most young women in my study had attended or were attending highly ranked universities, and those who were working at the time of interviewing them were pursuing competitive and demanding professions. They had little time for performing regular rituals or customs or observing di daily dietary injunctions as their mothers or grandmothers or other Jain women in India might do. So a focus on true religion allowed them to develop a committed Jain practice that revolved around living the Dharma in, in their everyday life, following vegetarianism or veganism and regular religious study. The one point in the year when they took time out of their busy schedules is during the festival of Purushan or Das Lakshan, as I mentioned earlier. And at the same time, this kind of Jain practice allows young Jain men living in the diaspora to also develop a committed Jain practice whilst pursuing education and careers. This is different from research, particularly that in India, that suggests that men demonstrate their commitment to Jain Dharma through donations to the Jain, to the temple or to the Jain center or taking leadership positions in Jain organizations or waiting to become more religious when they retire. Like young Jain women, young Jain men in my study were also interested in living the Dharma in everyday life, following vegetarianism or veganism conducting regular study, religious study, and becoming involved in transmitting Jain Dharma to other young Jains through teaching, writing blogs, or organizing events via various social media platforms. Okay, so I think I'll leave it there for now. Uh, and I very much look forward to the conversations later. And thank you for listening. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Shaw. Really appreciate um, those that very, very um, detailed study that you've done. And we look forward to, to learning more about that in discussion. Um, so I think I wanted to uh, turn it over next to um, Christopher Jane Miller, who is the Bhagwan Malinath, Assistant Professor of Jainism and Yoga uh, Studies um, at um, Loyola Marymount University. Um, and he has a numerous uh, accomplishments um, uh, from various fellowships, uh, including the Mellon Indian Ocean World's Dissertation Writing Grant um, to you know, work on uh, surfing yogis. He's taught courses on Hinduism, Jainism, and yoga, San uh, Sanskrit articles focusing on um, Jainism, yoga, and ecology. So we're very honored to have um, Professor Miller. I know he's very active also within um, the Jain community in North America. And so, um, and he recently um, actually did a course this summer focusing specifically on uh, Jain youth. And it's from that that he's going to um, give us his perspective on kind of where uh, Jain uh, young people are at in the United States and also globally. So Professor Miller. Thank you so much, Iqbal, for um, your introduction. And um, you can see my screen okay? Yeah, okay, great. So yeah, thank you, Iqbal, and thank you, FIU, for inviting me to give a talk today for the Nirvan Lecture 2021. I'm honored to do so. I'm going to talk today about a course that I taught over the summer, this last summer, called Earth is Calling You, a comprehensive course to rediscover and apply your Jain Dharma. This is a course that I was asked to teach by Jaina, specifically by Dr. Sulek Jain, Dr. Nitin Shah, and with the support of others such as Dr. Narendra Parson, who are very supportive of creating a safe space for Jain youth right within the age group that, that uh, Bindi Shah was talking about. They were from ages 17 to 34, so close to that same age group, where they could discuss topics that were important to them and that they felt they needed a safe space to be able to reflect on in light of their Jain Dharma and Jain philosophy. Just to briefly show you what the contents of this course were, and this comes from a uh, almost 500 page course workbook that I created for this course. We met with Jain youth from around the world leading up to this course to ask them, what are the things that are important to you? What do you wanna know about your Jain tradition? And how can I help you navigate those questions? So all the things that you see here across 15 days for three hours per day, so it was a 45 hour course and it was offered free with the sponsorship of Jaina, were covered uh, in this course. And you can see that these were the topics that were of importance to these Jain youth. And what I'm gonna do is just walk you through some of them to give you a sense of the types of questions the Jain youth were asking. Uh, we had a total of about 50 res, uh, registrations, and we had about a dozen students who, who finished the class in total. So some people had to come in and out. It was a big commitment, but I'm going to walk you through what some of those things were to show you really what the diasporic concerns were in the tradition. Many of the students came from India. Also, many of them came from uh, UK as well as from America. I was really surprised on day one that the students were interested in knowing about very basic things in their tradition. They wanted to know the meaning of Jai Janendra. They wanted to know the meaning of Ahimsa. They wanted to review why they are practicing or committed to the three jewels. So we went into really great detail uh, and gave them a space to ask those types of questions to set a foundation for everything that would follow. One of the big questions we started with, because it's such a big question among Jain youth, is what is the relationship between Jain tradition and science? Is Jainism a science? Well, in order to help them understand this question, the type of question that they're asking, we first looked at what is science? And we went back through the history of science and the European scientific revolution and the scientific method to allow them to see that Western scientific worldview is one way of viewing the world, one very powerful way of viewing the world, but it's different from the Jain tradition. And then we went into asking the question then, is Jainism scientific? And many students kind of stumbled over this, uh, as we'll see in a moment, because we tried to show them that the scientific worldview and the Jain worldview, though there are some overlaps, are two different ways of knowing the world. And that's okay. 
And we can get uncomfortable or we can get comfortable with the discomfort of seeing that we can't always reconcile the Jain tradition with the, uh, with the Western scientific worldview. I even quoted John Court, uh, John Court from Denison University, where he writes in the Brill Encyclopedia of Jainism, uh, not all results of scientific inquiry can be harmonized with the Jain worldview. For example, the biggest example we gave is that some Jains are still committed to the view that the world is flat. And when some of the students saw that this is something that's still going on today, they were a little bit uh, shocked to see that, oh, we can't always reconcile the Jain worldview with the scientific worldview. And so we had a lot of great discussion around that. And you could see that this is a big question about should we even be trying to reconcile it and why are we trying to reconcile it? So we did a little bit of deconstructive work for the students there. The other thing, and, and Dr. Bindi Shah just talked about this, is the students wanted to know what is the point of Jain ritual or the points of Jain ritual? Uh, many thought it was meaningless or thought, uh, you know, why are my parents practicing it and not living it outside of the, the temple system? And so in order to sort of reinvigorate an appreciation for Jain ritual, we talked about the origins of Jain ritual. What does it mean to even practice ritual more broadly to sort of embody Jain philosophy? We looked at lay icon and temple worship, puja, festivals and pilgrimage, the meanings behind these things historically. So we were using work like Paul Dundas's book, The Jains, to look into some of these basic topics. And we even looked at some of the meanings of dravya, Puja. So looking at Hari Bhadra and Yashovijaya's interpretations of Drabya Puja, as well as how God and goddess worship and why it's incorporated into the Jain tradition. I feel like the students came in feeling like they didn't want to talk about ritual or they were more curious about what it meant, but they left with an appreciation for, oh, it actually can mean something. And the change, the meaning is changing over time. And it's okay to be comfortable with that and to kind of take ownership over their own practice of ritual. The next big topic we talked about was Jain diet. And of course, uh, as Dr. Bindi Shah pointed out, uh, this is one of the main ways that young Jains identify with their tradition through the practice itself of Jain diet. We reviewed why Jains are committed to compassion and non-harming of animals. Uh, we looked at one through five sense beings to understand from the perspective of the Tirtankars and Jain philosophy why it's important, according to karma theory, not to harm beings to the extent possible. And then we looked at the list of abhakshas, the forbidden foods of Jainism very closely, to help them understand why root vegetables are forbidden according to Jain tradition, why other more obvious things like meat, but also things like figs, and try to help them understand the cultural logics that were underlying these abhakshas or these forbidden foods in Jain texts so that they could understand the logic and then decide for themselves, do they want to commit to that or not? We also then address the topic of shakahari, that what does it mean to be vegetarian? And Dr. Sulek Jain pointed out to me that shakahari is the word that we are really contending with here when we're trying to decide uh, if one should be vegetarian or vegan within the Jain tradition. And a lot of the students, when they saw the implications of a vegan diet versus the violence in the dairy industry, many of them actually transitioned to being vegan during the course and were committed to that as a, a really a, a practice of their Jain values. Another important topic amongst Jain youth was Jain views on alcohol. Many of them wanted to know if they can drink alcohol and why so many times they've been told they can't drink alcohol. Of course, alcohol is a huge topic that comes up both for young Jains who are in high school, in college, as well as young professionals who are surrounded by the pressures and temptations of Western society to consume alcohol in these social settings. We first looked at common contemporary Jain reasons for not using alcohol. So I wanted to show them what some of the elders in the tradition are saying and writing about it. For example, we looked at the blog Jainism Says, which is, I believe, run by uh, Praveen Shah. And we we unpack some of the reasons for health and as well as spiritually why the, the, the Jain tradition forbids the use of alcohol. We also then went into Jain texts to look at the scriptural prohibitions on alcohol. Why is it that Jain texts proscribe alcohol? What does it do? And particularly we focused on a lot of the consequences of drinking alcohol in the Jain tradition, which were primarily because it creates a diluted worldview according to Jain texts 
but also some of the other consequences and how it fits in with other lists of things that are considered to be detrimental to one's spiritual progress on the Jain uh, path towards liberation. And so again, we didn't tell students don't drink alcohol, but we allowed them to ask the questions in light of their philosophy so that they could make a decision do I want to, or do I not want to drink alcohol and, and why? So it was really trying to create a safe space to approach these difficult things. We also looked uh, on day nine at gender in the Jain tradition. So we looked at the fact that the Jain tradition, generally speaking, has three different genders and that there are important gender differences between the different traditions, Shvetambar and Digambar, particularly the fact that women cannot be liberated in the Digambar tradition versus the Shvetambar tradition. But more importantly, we looked at lay gender roles. So we looked at some of the different roles that uh, males and females take within the Jain tradition, specifically with regard to things like fasting, doing business, uh, giving, philanthropy, who really takes those roles up. And what I noticed, started to notice as I worked through this is a sort of progressive stance among the Jain diaspora, particularly in uh, Western countries where they saw, you know, feminism and the, the values of feminism as important and wanted to see women elevated into roles of leadership. And we actually had guest speakers come and talk about that in particular. Finally, we looked at Malinat, uh, which my, my own chair is named after, the only female Tirtanka, according to Shvetambar tradition. And there was a little bit of debate there as to whether or not, of course, Malinat could be female. But I was also surprised that even those among the Digambars who were present, present in the class, there wasn't a huge pushback against the idea that Malinat could be female. And so I got more of the sense that there was more of an openness to uh, tradition, to women having this possibility within their own tradition to be liberated and to take the role of a Tirtanka. On day 10, we looked at sex and the body in the Jain tradition. Of course, along with alcohol, drugs, food, and all other things, uh, the body is a central concern within Jain philosophy in terms of our attachment to it. And so what I tried to show them within the Tattvarta Sutra, for example, is that it's necessary to have a well, to have good health or to have a good body, generally speaking, from a karmic perspective, in order to be able to engage in spiritual practice, but ultimately you then have to renounce the body fully in order to attain liberation. So we played with this tension, and you could see the tension between the young students who are mostly concerned about their bodies, wanted to look good, wanted to feel good. We even had Janil Shah, a Jane bodybuilder, come speak to us about his own sort of tensions with, with with being a bodybuilder as a Jane, he's really well known on social media, and also the fact that we can't be attached to the body. So they got like a real sense of what that's what those tensions are like within the the Jane uh, philosophy versus the way that their actual lives are and the pressures they have to maintain themselves. We also looked at the concept of brahmacharya and what it means within the Jain householder life specifically, and as it applies to them, how it applies uh, in the steps towards liberation for the Jain lay householder, because of course, sex in the body is a, is a huge topic and they're under the, uh, the very fast changing world that we live in and are exposed to all kinds of thoughts and ideas through social media. And so I tried to show them through Jain text what it says about these kinds of things. And uh, there was like a lot of, again, trying to create a safe space for these students to be able to have these conversations that they felt were normally uncomfortable or they were afraid to ask within their own tradition. So uh, the feedback we got on the course is that they felt very safe asking these questions. We then took a deep dive into ecology, environment, and animals in the Jain tradition. As Dr. Bindi Shah also mentioned, these students are very much concerned with this world, with animals, and specifically with the environment. We talked about pundra poles, what those mean in India as animal sanctuaries. And a big topic there was climate change. Of course, this is a, a universal concern right now. And the Jain youth have a very particular set of questions they're asking because they're concerned about the way that, that Jains consume, being so wealthy and how much Jains consume. They were really not afraid to ask the question of, you know, we have all this wealth and we make all this money and we consume. Uh, don't we have to kind of take that into consideration with regard to our own climate impact as a global community and as a global business community? We also then, of course, didn't leave them hanging. And we talked about potential Jane solutions to environmental challenges. 
various forms of entrepreneurship that Jane's could enter into to help with renewable energy, to help create plant-based foods, to spread the plant-based lifestyle, to become actively engaged in the global uh, environmental movement and global environmental activism. And the students were really keen on, as I said before, a lot of them became vegan as a result when they saw the climate impact of dairy and were really happy to uh, get more involved in the community. And related to that on day 12, we talked about social justice in the Jane tradition and on a related topic, politics. The students wanted to know what's the relationship between Jane, Jainism and politics? How does my vote fit in with my Jane values and who do I vote for based on the principle of nonviolence or non-harming? We looked at Acharya Tulsi and the Anuvrat movement. We looked at Acharya Chandanaji and a lot of the great work she does with Virayatan in Bihar and uh, some of the students have been involved in that themselves. And we also looked more specifically at the impact of Jainism on global social justice movements. So we looked at Gandhi, we looked at Martin Luther King, and we looked at the way that nonviolent resistance and politics is a powerful way to create social change and to reinvigorate the students to uh, want to participate in these types of things on their own. Finally, on day 14, we looked at uh, career and leadership role models. We had a lot of guest speakers come in, Jane entrepreneurs, Jane uh, leaders within Jaina, who gave us talks about the roles that these students could start to take in their own lives to make a positive impact and institutionalize Jane values wherever they were. And so just to conclude here, uh, Jane youth, they really want to know how Jane Dharma applies in their daily life. And they're asking critical questions about their tradition. They're concerned about social justice. They're concerned about their own class privilege. They're concerned about the environment. They're concerned about generational differences between their parents' generations and their generation, the second generation, as Dr. Bindi Shah said. They're, they're very progressive, creative, and powerful if given the space and are becoming also more globally connected through social media and the internet. The latest and greatest example of that is Sunny Jane's Global Jane Network and the Jane Vegan Initiative, which was started during the pandemic and has a great potential to connect Janes across the world and is connecting Janes across the world into various movements of animal rights activism, environmental activism, social networking, social justice networking, and a whole bunch of things like that. So thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Iqbal. I really appreciate it. It's nice to be here with you all. I look forward to speaking with you. Jajanendra. All right, Jajanendra. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. I really appreciate that. Um, and very interesting, I think, the type of innovative work you're doing with um, connecting with Jane youth and developing especially the materials that they need to kind of intellectually engage with their own community within, in their own language, I think, which is a huge deal. I think that the language barrier and being able to understand it within this sort of logical context, I think helps them rationally understand their own tradition, which I think is really important for second generation um, uh, Asian Americans and of course, Jane's um, as part of that. Wonderful, thank you so much again. And now I wanna turn it over to uh, Venu Mehta, who is um, currently the Bhag Bhagwan Chandra Prabhu um, postdoctoral fellow. Uh, in Jane Studies um, at CST, Claremont School of Theology, and she's also an associate assistant professor of comparative religions. Um, her doctoral thesis focused on the Jane goddess uh, Padmavati, and she has um, completed her uh, doctoral work at the University of Florida, and we're very happy that she is also, to say that she's also an alumni of Florida International University. Um, so she's actually now completing her second PhD at the University of Florida. Um, and she has done extensive work uh, doing her uh, master's thesis here at FIU on um, uh, ethnographic study of sectarian negotiations between diaspora Janes in the United States. Um, she's in, she has had many different awards, including uh, the Fulbright FLTA at Indi Indiana University in Bloomington. She's taught Gujarati there. Um, she herself was a professor in her own right in India before she came uh, to the United States and is doing a second doctorate uh, in Jainism. So she's an accomplished scholar, a writer, a translator in Gujarati. And we're very honored to have uh, Professor Mehta join us. Um, and I will turn it over to you. 
Thank you, Dr. Iqbal. After it feels really a great pleasure to be back as a as a speaker, as a finalist uh, at the you know the Jane Studies program of the university where I had my own foundation. So I'm really thankful to all my mentor, including of course you on my committee, Professor Woz, Nathan Katz, and everybody. And of course, I see my another mentor here, Dr. Bindi Shah. She has spent several hours discussing with me on my diaspora work before I moved to Padmavati Research. And it was pleasant listening to you, Dr. Shah, and of course, Dr. Zain Miller. Uh, so, uh, well, I would uh, talk about uh, how American Jain youth actually contributed in construction and reconstruction of a Jain identity within the US. And some of the theme that emerge uh, that I will take support of. Uh, this theme emerged from my extensive uh, ethnographic research for my master's project during the uh, year 2016 to, I mean, 15 to 17. So, and in, in, in a part of this uh, theme emerged is, is because of like, uh, when I was discussing uh, my topic and my questions with Dr. Iqbal Akhtar, and he asked me that, when would you like to ask and inquire about what's like a Jain identity post 9-11? And that actually helped me a lot. And that actually introduced me to a kind of a completely new uh, structure of that how even uh, children and youth, both age group between like 5 to 12 and then 12 to 18, helped Jain, uh, you know, first, first generation, second generation, like parents, uh, help construct their own identity within the U.S. So what I found that, that uh, when I interviewed, I, uh, of course, I did not talk to the children directly, of course, informally, but when I talked to them, I realized that there are two things happening. The first thing is that they are constructing and reconstructing their Jane identity in a multicultural world of the United States of America. And the second thing, they're recreating, reconstructing their own Jain identity, so external and internal. Now, what was that Jain identity and how the youth helped in you know, recreating the Jain identity uh, for their own community, for their own space, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So the first, so the thing that I found out and the, the major theme that emerged was sectarian negotiations. And I could see a question uh, there, of course, that was for Dr. Shah, but <laughs> I might answer that question in my presentation. So I found that there is a there is a new identity going on. That the construction of new identity is still in shape, and that's a sectarian negotiation. Now, what is sectarian negotiation? And uh, so sectarian negotiation means to to overcome all the barriers of different sects within Jainism, and to live with complete integrity uh, and on a overlapping and not falling into any sectarian uh, windows, but to be just like simple one, Jain identity. So some of the answers were when I asked questions to this you know, young generation, the kids, they said like, I am Jain. So they did not even know that I am Swetambar, I am Digambar, I am this, I am that. The justice would say, I am Jain. Now, how this is a result. So what was the process? Let me go a little back to that. And so when I interviewed the parents, they said that, look, we had already created a temple. We had already constructed a temple. We had already a place for worship. But then when our children, when they accompanied us, they started asking us questions. So the cognitive questions they had was very stimulating for them. It's very reinforcing. It was inspiring them to rethink about their own identity within the Jain tradition in the US, as well as for the uh, other communities and religions outside. So the children ask, started asking questions, for example, why do we have different rituals? Why there are different angis? why there are iconographic differences of the Jinnah images or any other images of the temple, why there are different decorations, why, why do that some images in the temple have ornamentations and some do not? Why do we have, why do 
a, a, a one group sits in one side and other group sits on the other side and so on and so forth. So it felt that the children were curious about the differences and the parents, the, the, the answers, the responses that I received from the parents that that was the moment, um, and I'm quoting that that was the moment that we realized that we, are, we need to look into this matter very seriously. And uh, so they rethought about that differences, holding on to differences will not work because they wanted to give a definite gene identity to the new generation because when they go out in the society, they have to introduce themselves. And, and it seemed that that was really confusing for them to, because that's a, it's a small community. For example, let's say 100 family in one place and in, uh, in one city, maybe 200 families in another town, in another city. So the, the motivation was to produce, to give one single, you know, separate gene, unique gene identity without any sectarian differences and features. And uh, the parents informed that we st started rethinking about what should be the fake focus of our temple activities, A, and then also the social activities. And how should we reorganize the temple structure, the, the meetings, the interactions, different festivals, different social uh, gathering in a way that we just, you know, demonstrate a single Jain, a unique single united Jain identity. And the, then after uh, it made certain changes into, of course, there is a kind of a, uh, overall, a kind of a unique Parshala program, but they started also introducing some features to the Parshala at their local level, where they introduce a teaching where do not inform them about just the difference, but also the similarities and you know a common commonality between the different sets. So, uh, in in my in my finding, uh, children were curious to learn about the rituals. They were curious to learn about. Uh, at the same time, they want to learn about the differences of different sects, but they 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 were really not very really willing to accept that there can be a difference because when they started meeting other people outside, their friends in the school, in the neighborhood, they, they just wanted to say that we are Jain. So my finding in, 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 in you know, I would just uh, like to end my uh, talk here with saying that this, the construction of the sectarian negotiation among the Jains, amongst the religious diaspora, among the Jains in the US, is actually, you know, in a way inspired by the youth. And they see a very pragmatic aspect of Jainism, a social pragmatic aspect of Jainism, because uh, just not the religion, they are more concerned also about the social identity outside their own Jain group. Uh, so uh, that's something very unique about uh, uh, American Jainism that is very much inspired by you know young, young generation. And uh, uh, yeah, so. I think that's all. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Professor Reno. Really, um, that was very interesting. And um, it was really great to get um, the process as well to think about kind of how you got to this research and, and the, the methodology of, of sort of connecting to them. So I think um, now what we can do is uh, we can open it up for the question and answer session. But I guess before we do that, um, did you, as panelists, uh, did you want to respond to each other or um, say anything to each other in terms of the, the presentation that you saw? Um, and then if you have something to say, we can say that, or if you don't have anything to say, then we can go to the questions and we already have two questions up as well. Please, Professor Shah. Uh, it was very uh, fascinating to listen to both uh, Chris and Meru. Um, Chris, it was interesting that the, the themes and the questions that the young uh, James uh, who took your course uh, echo actually many of the themes uh, that I found 10 years ago. So in many ways, the same issues and the same concerns and the same sort of ponderings uh, are, you know, uh, Jane youth are grappling with them. And so, so that's really interesting to hear that 
even though YJA has kind of been dealing with some of these issues in, in their conventions, you know, it's uh, generationally, we're still uh, having to address the same kind of quandaries. Uh, but also, also the concern with social justice. And I think what was new, I think, is the recognition of class privilege uh, amongst the, the participants in your in your course there. So, so that that was very interesting for me to hear. Uh, and and Renu, I think um, what you found is actually exactly the the pragmatism uh, in the U.S. context. You know, given that the the Jane diaspora is so spread out uh, mm -hmm. that you know, uh, so the pragmatism and and secondly that in the US context, uh, a Jain identity is not just a religious identity, it's kind of an ethno-religious identity that's important for social, uh, a sense of belonging and community as well, which is different in, in the UK. So, so it was very interesting to hear how, you know, sort of the process of how that has put, been created in, in the US, so yeah. Please, yeah, Professor Miller, yeah. Yeah, but I was thinking along the same lines as 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 um, Bindi Shah. So Bindi, yeah, I, I hearing your presentation uh, backed by data, you know, really made me feel like uh, what I thought was sort of anecdotal at first. These topics I was teaching um, actually are kind of grounded in the reality of uh, of what Jane's in the diaspora are thinking. So. Um, yeah, so, so many of the topics I tried to mention it as, as, as I was going along. Um, and with regard to the class privilege, I was also surprised by that uh, when the question came up among uh, several of the Jane youth, and it led to a long discussion about what do we do about this? Um, it's not usually, it's, not, it's something we, we, we talk about in the academic circles with regard to any tradition or group, right? We always ask questions of class, and I was really surprised that they brought it up. Um, I didn't, I didn't kind of prod for any of that. And, uh, they were the ones who it emerged from the Jane youth. Like they were able to see it. And I was really actually surprised and, and, and actually quite happy to have that conversation with them. Um, yeah. And, and as Vanu was saying that the pragmatic side of things, like you mentioned, uh, the focus was always on how do I apply this in my daily life? Um, how do, how, what does this mean for me today? And really moving away from, and I know that this this whole event is kind of framed in the sense that there's a moving away from ritual towards making an ethical life out of Jainism. And I felt like the majority of the class, besides the time that I was talking about Jain ritual to kind of just show them some of the history of it, that was what they wanted to know. Um, please tell me why, what I'm supposed to do with this in my daily life. And just the, the very idea that you could take Jain texts and put them into practice um, was sort of the the uh, social fact, I guess, of what it is that they wanted to do. So, anyways, I appreciated both your conversation or both of your presentations because it really made me feel like, okay, that you know, the the class was grounded in something solid and real um, in some social science. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Robert. Please, Professor Vena. Yeah. yeah. Meta. Uh, Doctor, I have a kind of not a question, but I want to share some some experience, and maybe you can help us uh, with that so being a young scholar I mean young not in the sense of age but young and experience and also a new uh, te uh, teaching Jainism and it's a kind of a new experience and so what I am experiencing these days while teaching Jainism to my students at CSD uh, is that so when we when we try to teach about Jainism now but now we have at least two models to talk to about like what is the Jain identity and how, how what Jains do. One is Indian and one then is, of course, you know, since they are in the US, it's the component that we will, of course, fascinated to include in our teaching that Jain. And uh, my students were really uh, smart enough to catch the difference that there is something going on in, in the US, which is completely different uh, in, in terms of the activities and uh, ethical practices. Uh, rituals, so on and so forth, everything, um, and the, and and also they see the when because I we we show them a different you know aspect of Jain uh, Jainism in India. So what should you know those teachers like teaching professors teaching Jainism uh, to the uh, to students in the U.S. What should they do? Like how how should they uh, 
kind of uh, organize this content and different approach and examples particularly and what themes which emerge when you you know you know when you uh, use two different kinds of models to show them different aspects of Jainism? Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer what we should teach, but I think what I would say is um, one of the things that I'm very conscious of, I don't teach Jainism because I'm a sociologist, but one of the things that I'm very conscious about is that when we talk about Jainism, particularly in India, we don't kind of fossilize it. We don't essentialize it. You know, it, it's it's a you know it's a cultural concept. It's a living religion, uh, and you know, I'm not aware of any research at the moment on Jain youth in India. But anecdotally, and what I'm hearing is that even Jain youth in India are changing their practices. Right? You know, mm -hmm. India has you know in the last 10, 15 years has has gone through massive economic growth, opportunities, um, globalization, and so on. So, it, and that's impacting Jain youth in India too. Uh, and what will be interesting is, you know, maybe the three of us can do some research on, on Jain youth in India um, and compare uh, what's happening between youth in the diaspora. But what I would say is that the frameworks that we use, the kind of the um, intellectual frameworks that we use to, is to say that, you know, these are historically specific uh, constructs, mm -hmm. even in yeah. India, they're not essential constructs. So, you know, the research that we use in terms of um, uh, the text that we use in, in, in empirical research in India has been done in a certain time and a certain uh, context, right? And mm -hmm. we're now doing research in a certain time and a certain context in the US, which is why I was very keen to sort of 10 years on to do another round of interviews and see if anything has shifted. Uh, so I think that's what we have to be aware of, that we don't, you know, that the stu uh, students understand that these are living religions, that they're, they're historically based constructs, you know, uh, and, and they're constantly shifting. Uh, they're, not, they're not fossilized in any way, even in India. So that's kind of what I would say to, to create that kind of framework. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much. If I may just briefly respond to that too. I, um, um, so yeah, it was one of the things we emphasized at the beginning of the course. We're we're kind of mining these texts for where we find answers to these questions, but then also some of the answers in the texts don't make sense anymore to the Jain youth, right? One of the biggest examples that we all know of is, you know, with the among the Jain vegans, they'd rather eat a root vegetable than drink milk, right? Um, so when we look at the abuchas, things like that come up, and and I had to emphasize to them. And I'm I'm actually trained as an ethnographer. I'm not a philosopher, so I also have an appreciation for the social science and the way that we're constructing tradition, and to constantly remind them that this is what your texts say, but it's a living tradition and it's always changing. So like that's why we kind of try to create a space where they could decide what they want to do with it. Um, so I felt a tension within myself pedagogically between wanting to not essentialize the tradition, but also give them some ground to stand on to from which to make a decision um, from from a, a pedagogical perspective. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you. 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 All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So I guess we can go with the, the last question first. I think it'd be interesting just kind of based on our discussion so far. So this is from John Court. Um, so it seems to me that in a time of the global intertwined movements around issues of race, such as Black Lives Matter and Dalit Lives Matter, any discussion on Jane youth in the future of American diaspora needs to include race as a factor in your research and analysis. This applies also to the study of Jane youth in Europe, UK, Canada, and India, especially as race is constructed differently in the various nations and cultures. Please discuss how the Jane youth you have studied are responding to the racial definitions, tensions, and oppressions that they inevitably face in their day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, anyone? I, I, I read John's question. Thank you, John, for your question. I, I read that earlier in the chat, and I was trying to think back on when that came up in the class. 
that I was teaching. And it did at the point when we reached social justice and we started talking about Gandhi and Martin Luther King um, and the civil rights movement in the US as well as Black Lives Matter uh, to a certain extent. And um, one of the students, some of the students were a little bit dismayed because they had uh, experienced it firsthand as you're saying. And one of them brought up, for example, the Bindi murders, I think they were called, or attacks that occurred on the East Coast in the United States where so many people um, of, of Indian descent were, were attacked, brutally attacked, just simply because they had a Bindi and because of the color of their skin and the way they dress. Um, so there was a concern and also some of the students, not only in that class, but also in my own university class, who identify as Jain or even uh, just as Hindu or, or um, one of the Dharma traditions have also kind of related to me the increased tension that they're facing um, on the ground in, in, in America just because of the color of their skin. We recently had an incident at our own university where a student uh, was, was mocked and teased because of the color of her skin. And um, it's, it's really kind of, um, it's an important topic, I agree. So I think uh, I, if I were to teach this class again, I would probably um, add a section more devoted to, to looking at it in the American context uh, more carefully from a historical perspective to help them understand how they fit into it. Because a lot of the students were concerned about that and brought up a lot of incidences, like such as the ones I'm describing, the Bindi murders and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah, thanks, John. Can I come in there, Echo? Please. Yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right, John. That's a, a really, really important question. Um, and, and I think the other the other difference that my my interviews this time around, this past summer has raised, particularly in the US context, uh, is an awareness of privilege, you know, a class privilege and race privilege, particularly in the uh, US context, uh, that many of the participants, in many ways, class has protected them from overt racial uh, incidences, you know, maybe not subtle, but certainly overt racial in incidences. But I think what's different is that this, this sort of um, cohort of young Janes are, are beginning to be aware of their privilege in the US context uh, and the racial hierarchies in the US and, 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 the, and therefore their responsibility in some ways uh, to have these conversations uh, amongst themselves within their families and communities about that privilege and, and what um, uh, support and solidarity for the Black Lives Matter movement might look like from, from a Jane perspective. In the UK context, I can't talk about Europe, but in the UK context, I feel like that that conversation is not yet happening, that certainly the Jane community uh, in, in the UK is also quite privileged, you know, especially uh, particularly those who came from, from an East African heritage uh, are quite privileged, but there isn't the same kind of engagement that I feel in, in the UK with wider issues and, and the kind of role that Jane youth might play in those wider uh, questions about uh, racial justice and social justice. And, um, you know, partly it, I think it's a role for the the organizations to have those conversations um, that are based on, on so living in the UK, belonging in the UK, identity in the UK, and so on. A lot of the Jain organizations are much more focused on sort of the religious um, philosophy and identity rather than the social element of that identity. But definitely different important questions to ask uh, in all contexts in the diaspora, yes. Thank you, Professor Shaw. Um, the Professor Mehta, did you want to say anything? Yeah, um, thank you, Dr. Kaur, for that really uh, interesting and thought-provoking question. So, well, in my uh, ethnographic research, I I did not get any clean emerge of the race, but I certainly found out that this um, uh, with the with this sector and negotiation, what. Uh, what's happening is uh, a byproduct is um, developing a unique separate Jain identities from Hinduism and Buddhism in the U.S. And uh, what I found is a trend that 
transnationally, what happens in India uh, really uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, encourage them to shift the, the way they identify themselves in the, in the US. So it, it's very much depending upon the political, the social, the cultural uh, or ongoing things in India and pertaining to different religions or religious identity within the India. Uh, can it be like Hindu nationalism, Hindutva, Hinduism? And so I think uh, it, with, with this new Jain identity, what, what I found that uh, Jains are trying to, uh, trying to create a Jain identity that identifies with complete non-violence, like non-violence at social, cultural, and political level, which is which they, according to them, uh, in, implicitly and explicitly, is not uh, synonymous with uh, uh, Hindu nationalism or Hindutva or any any sort of any sort of like aggressive social and religious identity within the U.S. And I think that was a safe place for them to create. And at the same time, uh, a very unique and separate identity from Buddhism in terms of like developing, you know, scholarship on Jainism, because when it, because it, it most of the time it happens that when people ask that Jainism, it's like, what, what, what religion are you talking about? So that was the question they were facing. So I think uh, I found this theme emerged out, out of my ethnographic research, which was not directly with the race, but with uh, kind of a very unique, distinct religious identity and related issues. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think going back to the first question then, um, Nakia Nadim, who is joining us from India, um, she has a question, um, particularly thinking about the differences um, between the historic differences between the Shwetambra and Dagambra sects of Jainism. And what does that mean for second and third generation Jains living in the West? I know. Professor Mehta, we talked earlier about this idea of a non-denominational form of Jainism that's developed in the United States that really hasn't developed in the same way in the UK. Um, what is it about the American context that's changing the way that Jainism is historically understood, um, usually divided between these two traditions? I can speak just from my experience teaching the class um, and getting really more involved with the Jain youth over the past year, really, um, that first of all, the, the Jain Center of Southern California, where we are here, uh, I think they, as far as I know, there aren't any major tensions and there are there is more of a blurring of the lines uh, in terms of acceptance in the diaspora, right? Um, that they see themselves as more of a universal Jainism, Jaina, the Federation of Jain Associations in North America, is sort of an umbrella canopy that captures all traditions as kind of one Jain tradition that's um, universalized. And I remember reading in uh, John Court's article in the Brill Encyclopedia of Hinduism recently, uh, the, the summary of that kind of movement of, of it being a sort of ethical religion focused on very specific things that pays more attention to the way that the, the Jain identity is lived and, and, and shared rather than, um, rather than having some sort of uh, uh, divide within the community between these sectarian differences. And then also amongst my students, I, I think I mentioned this in my presentation, I was also surprised, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised, but oftentimes when I talk about things like Malinat in public settings, I get a lot of um, comments uh, or, or private messages to me uh, that are upset that I said Malinat could achieve liberation, um, even though you know, I'm saying according to Shvetambar tradition, but among the, the, the youth uh, in the diaspora particularly, I, uh, there wasn't pushback against these major sectarian um, ideas as I presented them. Um, I would say so, there was a little bit that came um, from some of the Indian students who are more grounded in those, in those traditions in India, but among the diaspora, uh, the diasporic students I didn't really experience, but even even some of the students from India, I was surprised they were more open amongst the youth to not having sectarian difference. So that's anecdotal. I mean, it's coming from my experience of, of working with them, but I never felt that uh, the tensions was more, as you say, the blurring of the lines and searching for a universal Jain identity. Wonderful. Um, Professor Shah, Professor Mehta. Um, just wanted to say a few words about the UK context. It's a bit complex here in the UK, I think, that 
uh, it varies between what's happening in London and perhaps what's happening in other sort of major cities in the UK, such as Manchester or, or Leicester. Certainly in London, where the majority of Jains live, in terms of the temples, we tend to have sectarian specific temples. Uh, but in my conversations with the second and third generations, you know, for them, these sectarian differences are not important. For them, what's important is understanding, you know, the term that one of them used before is the true religion, understanding the philosophy, uh, the, the, um, the ethical uh, value, values and so on. So I'm not sure if, if the, the first generation so sort of um, speaks to that. Uh, so there's a bit of uh, complexity here. But in, in places like uh, Leicester or Manchester, where there are much smaller communities, I think those sectarian differences uh, may, may have blurred already uh, amongst even the first generation, uh, uh, simply because of the pragmatism that there isn't a large enough community to have different uh, sex specific temples and so on. So, but, but there isn't, but we also don't have this national organization like Jaina in, 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 the, in the UK. There are attempts to, to create something, but at the moment we, there is nothing established to sort of pull everyone together. So uh, we'll see how things get, uh, go forward from uh, in the UK. Professor Mehta. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, well, I have a little discussed that part of sector and negotiation and how young generations questions and reflection really inspired the parents to uh, re-understand and reconstruct their identity. But uh, within, within this uh, theme, there was a sub-theme that emerged. And I also saw that in my experience that the parents informed that um, now they have to rethink about how they would present the historical aspect, the historical uh, information about Jainism to the young generation. So it was a very delicate uh, and you know deliberate discussions and, and thinking process about like what aspect of uh, history should be highlighted. Should it be the sectarian identity, which is actually very fascinating and interesting, right? But at the same time, by doing that, they did not want to overshadow the, the commonality, the common grounds. Um, so there was a kind of, there are several different ways they could negotiate and they could work out on the situation. But one of them, if I would have to uh, give a, an example, was one of them was to really uh, pick and choose those aspects which is common to all. And then some interesting aspects, sectarian interesting aspects, uh, as a as a matter of historical fact, as a matter of historical piece of information, as a matter of historical religious study, they would uh, of course share it with the young generation, so they know the diversity and richness of their history, because then because what they found was that cutting them off from the historic historical information, which includes lots of diversity uh, within the sectarian uh, denominations. It's also not a healthy practice because, um, and I, I think if, uh, I think Dr. Iqbal Akhtar and uh, Dr. Miller will also remember that when we had those clubhouses discussions, several youth, young generation people ask lots of questions about that, about okay. history. They wanna know more about the temple history of Jain traditions. And this would come with the package of sectarian features and attributes. So, I, I think uh, that's a very interesting, fascinating, maybe a research project that how is history being rewritten and approached and being delivered to the young generation. And maybe under the leadership of Bindi Shah, who could do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mehta. Um, all right, the next question is thinking about um, Jane support for human rights uh, and then the relationship with Hindutva. So how how do American um, uh, Jains or second generation American Jains think about that, this idea of human rights? And I guess it's also connected to the idea of what we talked about earlier in terms of race and class privilege. Um, so what is, if anybody wants to take that, All right. Um, 
Okay, so the next question then um, would be from... Uh... Iqbal, Iqbal, sorry, yeah. I, I had one thing I could say about it. Um, sure, 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 go which, ahead. Which is that the, the conversation came up about that in specific, and I had them read an article by YJ, uh, YJA, is it mm -hmm. YJA? Yeah, yeah, YJA, not YJP, um, where there was a there was a young Jane who uh, was was conflicted with this very question herself. And um, she, she, the article basically showed the, you know, that, that the younger Janes were more willing to kind of just accept that they have a generational difference in their opinion on politics. Uh, and she kind of conceded like, okay, my dad is going, this is a public article, you know, she said, my dad is going to vote for this person and I'm going to vote for this person and we're just going to agree to disagree. And that was kind of the, the sense that I got from a lot of them. Um, although there were some who were more, a bit more progressive uh, than, than that, but, but it was kind of an agree to disagree with the generation. But I, what I think it really highlighted was the generational difference. Um, I wonder how, if that's, if that's a, if that perspective is true across the board or not, I don't know. I haven't done a study of that, but um, I know other Jane scholars have asked the same question about um, where did the politics lay for Jane's on a kind of generational scope. And I, I'm actually curious to learn more about that myself. Uh, can I just come in there? I, yes, I don't know if there's any research on that, but I think it's a really interesting question and it speaks to um, young Jane's interest in social justice issues, I think, you know, uh, and politics widely. Um, and I think, uh, speaking as a Jane myself, I think there is a lot of reflection to be done about uh, our relationship as a Jane community to those kinds of ideologies and what that means for um, uh, uh, how we're seen as a community, but also uh, social justice issues and power in India. Um, I speak a little bit about this in an article that I wrote on Virayatan and, and um, the relationships that uh, uh, Jannaji and the other nuns have with politicians from the BJP. Very briefly, I don't go into it in detail, but it's certainly an area that that's worth doing some research in, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I guess like going forward for each of you, um, if you know you're interested in kind of doing more research on Jane youth uh, worldwide, uh, this is from um, uh, Dr. Kirti Jane. What are some um, more? How would you go further or deeper in terms of the research that you've already done on Jane youth? What are some new avenues that you think would be um, of interest in terms of? Uh, researching. I mean, we talked a little bit about um, doing a comparative study between uh, attitudes of Jain youth in India versus uh, attitudes of Jain youth in, in the diaspora. Are there any other topics or other things that you think would have been, would have been of interest to you in terms of future research agendas? Can I also answer this question? Absolutely, yeah, okay. please go ahead. Yes. Um, so with changing times and changing situation, politically, socially, and culturally across the world, and specifically if we see that uh, Jainism arms one part in India, you know, its counterpart in the US, then I would definitely like to do further extended uh, research into um, how young generation youth in, in the US would take help of the historical data and uh, the philosophical and cultural aspect uh, of Jainism, mm, particularly when Jainism started having interaction and encounters with different uh, religious traditions and culture, cult cultures uh, and geographically very different in, in India. And how would uh, they learn and how would they, uh, you know, situate situate those studies into their own understanding of their identity in the in the US because that's anthropologically a very important aspect uh, to study um, uh, because uh, I feel that uh, it needs to be it needs to be dig out to see that uh, what are different aspects they are constructing their identity and and what role this part would play into it so I would definitely like to do that. 
and how how that would uh, you know result into how they demonstrate themselves among others, their the cohorts and within the larger community as a leader, as a as a student, as a community member, and and so on and so forth. So, thank you. Um, I, uh, are there any more other responses for this question? Um, yes, so if I please. can come Yeah, in. yeah, please. Um, one of the things that I'm really quite interested in is understanding the, the transnational circulation of conversations and ideas and values uh, amongst Jain youth uh, in the diaspora, but also Jain youth in India. But some of my work speaks to the, these transnational circulations between the US and the UK. But I think what will be fascinating now, particularly in the context of all the transitions and changes that are going on in India, to see what kind of circulations I think Professor Shah um, just froze there for a minute. I thought it was my internet. Because yeah, I, I thought the same trying. thing. I wasn't <laughs> sure. All right, let's just give her a few seconds to see if she comes back on. Um, one of the uh, one of the next questions then would be thinking about um, the issue of. The difference, I think this is kind of interesting. Um, in the United States, and I think just generally in, in diaspora context, Jains are mistaken for Hindus. Um, do you feel that there was something important in terms of the differentiation um, by young Jains to say, we're not Hindu, we are Jain, and this is our identity? Or do you think they were comfortable with being part of a, like, a larger idea of a Hindu majority? Yeah, if I may, um, I think it depended where I was, but if I encounter a lot of Jains in the diaspora who are heavily connected with Hindu organizations, um, both in Europe and in the US, and oftentimes work together to do all kinds of things. Like, for example, we just had the meal serving program for Thanksgiving, and there's a lot of collaborations between the uh, Jain community and the Hindu community. So it's, I see a lot of fluidity on the ground in terms of pragmatic uh, work that they do. But then all, but from an identity perspective, it seems to me that they really want to understand their Jain identity as something separate and yet um, collabor collaborating with the um, broader Hindu community as well. So I see like a lot of collaboration and interaction that that is sort of synergistic and and beneficial to both. But in terms of an identity, I think that's something that's important, at least to the youth. Okay. Um, I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll just go back very quickly to Professor Shaw. She just joined us. Rejoined us again. Um, I think you we we lost you there for a minute. If you want to continue, that'd be wonderful. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. There's an echo here. Uh, um, maybe I should rejoin. Yeah. Sure, no problem. I'll, okay. I'll go with um, Professor Mehta. Um, same question. Um, did, are there any uh, issues um, being seen as uh, Hindu or part of a Hindu majority, or is there a desire to differentiate between Hindu and Jain uh, among second generation in the United States? Yeah, certainly that was something that I, uh, that theme that emerged and I found out in my experiences and the responses that I received from uh, from the Jain community members during my study, that they certainly wanted to, the agenda was like a very, you know, a kind of a mild agenda was to identify Jain, Jain, Jainism, Jain identity is really separate and unique from Hinduism. So that was kind of a recurrent theme and it can be seen uh, 
I think the both 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 parts of the world, also in India, it is going on, and also in here. So, and that also when I did my ethnographic study, that was the time when you know Jainism as a religious minority was being recognized by Indian government constitutionally. So that was also a very big time for to to think about all this aspect, and that was really yeah felt during my ethnography. Dr. Shah. So Wonderful, you thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Uh, no, I think I've sort of lost the conversation there. So can you just remind me <laughs> what is it that we're talking about? Now? Oh, sure. Yeah. So we were right now we're just talking about um, uh, young uh, young Jains and do they feel um, the need to differentiate themselves from the larger Hindu majority? Uh, in terms of being lumped in as Hindus. Um, and then I think what you were talking about before you got cut off was, um, uh, you know, new new avenues of research on, on young Jains, yeah. So either, either or both, whatever you'd like to do. Okay, well, well yes, yeah. so in terms of new avenues, I think it would be fascinating to, to do some research, a comparative research project on Jain youth in India and this uh, circulation of, of ideas uh, practices and so on, uh, because there is such a lot of interaction going on at the moment, and also through social media as well. So that would be fascinating. Um, as to the second question, that hasn't really come up in my in my conversations with with the Jain youth in terms of constructing a separate identity. Um, one of well. It, in the sense that it came up in the sense that particularly in the last uh, census in, in the UK, there was a, a, a drive, a real drive to uh, identify as Jane, you know, to take other and write in Jane as an identity and, and not, and not um, just tick the Hindu box and, and amongst the young people as well, there was a real drive to do that. Uh, so in that sense, I suppose there is a drive to construct a separate uh, and unique Jane identity. Okay, wonderful. So I think um, we're coming up on time. So I think now I just like to open it up to you three, maybe for just a minute or so of your closing remarks. Um, anything that you'd like us to know about your research or anything you'd like us to take away um, from your thinking about um, um, young American Janes or the future of the Jane community in the United States. Uh, Professor Shah, you want to go? Okay. Um, so, as I said, I'm doing um, some follow up interview, well, not follow up interviews, I'm doing a second round of interviews uh, with uh, Jane youth in both countries. Uh, I think one of the things that I would be interested in, uh, and, and Chris uh, touched on this a little bit in terms of the rituals, you know, while there's a strong sense that Jane youth are not interested in the rituals, uh, there's also um, some interest among some of the, the youth in terms of the way rituals can um, uh, facilitate not only Jain practice, but the sense of Jain community, partic particularly the collective rituals. Uh, and and I, I'd be quite interested in pursuing that element in the future as well, that how collective rituals like Barusha um, particularly because that seems to be quite significant for Jane Wood. What, you know, what is it that's uh, attractive about that? And, is, and it is, I think, about coming together as a community in a collective sense uh, and, and uh, enacting Jane Dharma in, in a collective way. It, it is very much an individual religion in other um, times. And so I think that's quite an interesting area to think about. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Professor Shaw. Um, Professor Miller? Yes, thank you for having me, Iqbal. And um, I agree with Bindi. I think that's a fascinating route uh, to pursue, for sure. I'd love to hear about it. Um, I think overall, for me, I, I look forward to continuing to work with the Jane youth uh, in terms of helping them answer their questions and navigate questions about how this Jane Dharma applies and helping them continue to understand that this is a living religion and to also support them in their endeavors to make the world a better place. Because the sense that I got from a lot of the students was 
they, they don't only want to be better Janes, but they really, they really are concerned about social justice issues, environmental issues, and things like this. And in my own ethnographic research into particularly mostly into yoga communities, but now increasingly into Jain communities, I'm always interested in how these really high religious ideals uh, meet the road, how the rubber meets the road, basically, because it's when that happens, when that friction happens between ideals and reality, uh, that's where the, the beauty of ethnography uh, kind of uh, emerges, right? And um, I guess so from a pedagogical perspective, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see how Jane ideals um, all, all across the board uh, meet, the, meet the road and, and then how we can support the Jane youth in, in helping them construct their own um, identity and, and also you know, take some pride in the tradition, which uh, for me, it's, it's something that I love personally. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have changed my middle name to Jane, but um, I, I want them to appreciate it uh, as well and, and, and it helps support the global Jane community just facilitate that process, but with, with a critical lens, right? Because um, I always will bring that into the study uh, of any, any uh, religious phenomena that I, that I look at. So thank you for allowing me to present. It was great to, to hear Bindi and, and Venu as well, and I look forward to uh, hearing from you all in the future. Thank you so much, Professor Miller. And with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Mehta. Uh, first of all, again, thank you very much for organizing this wonderful uh, Nirvana lecture series in a panel discussion format. It was a wonderful idea. So maybe I would like to continue with a research on sectarian negotiations, but with like more new unexplored layers and what are the different connections that it, it can entail and it entails. Uh, that connects, uh, that includes not only the, the Jain world here in the US, but what the Jain world looks like in terms of, uh, of course, uh, as jo Dr. Kort said, like race theories, race aspects, Hindutva aspects. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll like to, <laughs> after my PhD project is I'm done with that, I can pursue that further. Thank you. That'd be great. Yeah, I think it'd be nice. I think eventually if we're able to do like kind of a research team focusing on kind of thinking about different aspects of Jane youth and even how Jane, one of the things that I think I like about working in terms of ethnographic groups is just, is not just uh, focusing on even just one group, but thinking about it kind of in comparative perspective. So, you know, thinking about, okay, um, uh, young Janes, uh, maybe young Hindus in the United States, uh, uh, Muslims, Sikhs, you know, there's so many different sort of groups and looking at, okay, how are they negotiating? What are the differences and what are the similarities across the various groups? And I'm going to think that there's quite a lot of similarities actually in terms of the way that they're negotiating. So I think that it's a really, it's a great avenue for collaborative research, which I think would be something that, you know, could really sort of benefit all, all of us. So with that, I will turn it over to um, Samaniji uh, Chaitanya Prabhya, who is our visiting professor from JVBI um, and also uh, Jane Nunn. So she is going to recite a benediction of the Namakar Mantra, um, and then we will conclude our session. So uh, Samaniji, I turn it over to you. So thank you, uh, Dr. Ikma, for organizing this wonderful program at the great occasion of the 2,549th annual uh, liberation day of uh, Mahavir. So it is a really very fascinating discussion. And uh, yeah, we have to look for some new challenges, transitions, changes, and we have to see how the community can be unified uh, on the basis of the basic philosophy and its ethical principles, which can be more appealing to the new generation, second generation and third generations. And uh, what uh, Velu Mehta and Bindi Shah has, and Miller has thought, uh, have thought about some new areas of research, those will be more appealing to the coming generations. So I'm very much thankful to all the uh, you young, uh, what we say, speakers of this particular program, and uh, very much thankful to uh, Iqbal for thinking about this new way of organizing this uh, annual Mahavir Nirvan lecture series. So, with these uh, few words, uh, I am uh, now reciting uh, one uh, stuti of uh, Bhagwan Mahavir. Uh, 
as a benediction. <coughs> Om Ding Namo Om Ring Namo Sitan Om Ring Namo Ayriyan Om Ring Namo Thank you so Thank much. You so much. That was beautiful. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, conclude our annual Nirvan lecture at Florida International University on behalf of the Jane Studies Program. I wanted to thank um, each of the speakers, uh, Professor Bindi Shah, Professor uh, Christopher Jane Miller, and Professor Venu Mehta. Um, we we're quite excited um, to embark on this new type of research, uh, focusing on uh, the future of Jainism in the United States. And for the Jayanti lecture next semester, I'll be showcasing a little bit of our new work on um, Jain studies in Pakistani universities and kind of new avenues of research on the history of Jainism um, in Pakistan. So hopefully you'll be master for that. So with that, I want to thank you so much um, for joining us and we conclude our program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. extending the horizon as always. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you. Thank you, Samhiji. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.